Chapter Seventeen of Memoirs of Madame Vigée Le Bon. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista. Memoirs of Madame Vigée Le Bon by Elizabeth Louise Vigée Le Bon, translated by Lionel Strachey. Chapter Seventeen persons and places in britain although the kind treatment i received induced me to stay three years in london whereas i had intended to pass but three months the climate of that town seemed very melancholy to me it even disagreed with my health and i seized every opportunity to take a breath of pure air in the lovely vales and dales of england where i could at least see some sunlight i began shortly after my arrival by spending a fortnight with madame chinery at gilwell where i found the celebrated viotti the house was most luxurious and i was given a charming welcome on reaching the place i saw that the gate was garlanded with flowery wreaths twined about the pillars on the staircase similarly decorated stood at intervals little marble cupids holding vases filled with roses in short it was a springtime fairy pageant so soon as i had entered the drawing-room two little angels madame chinnery's son and daughter sang a delicious piece of music to me composed for me by that good-natured viotti i was truly touched by this affectionate greeting indeed the fortnight i spent at gilwell were days of joy and gladness madame chinnery was a beautiful woman with much mental subtlety and charm her daughter then fourteen years of age played the piano astonishingly so that every evening this young girl viotti and madame chinnery herself an excellent musician gave us a delightful concert i recollect that my hostess's son though yet a child had a veritable passion for study he could not be made to lay his books aside when his hours of recreation came and i told him to go out and play with his sister he would reply i am playing at the age of eighteen the young man had already earned so much credit that at the restoration he was charged with reviewing all the accounts of the expenditure occasioned by the stay of the english army in france i was not tardy in making other excursions to the surroundings of london and these excursions absorbed all the time i could spare for pleasure at windsor the royal residence i admired only the park which is very fine the king enjoyed walking on a splendid terrace whence a magnificent and extensive view is to be got hampton court is another royal castle here i saw superb stained-glass windows which are very old and which i thought superior to any i had seen hitherto i also found some grand pictures and some large cartoons done by raphael which i could not admire enough the cartoons were on the floor so that i knelt before them such a long time that the custodian was surprised in the galleries i was shown armor and weapons dating back to remote ages then in the gardens gorgeous yellow rose bushes and finally a gigantic vine enclosed in a hothouse that in some year or other yielded fifteen hundred pounds of grapes i went with prince beriatinsky and a few other russians to pay a visit to the famous dr herschel this renowned astronomer lived in strict seclusion at some distance from london his sister who was always with him aided him in his astronomical researches and one was fully worthy of the other both in learning and noble simplicity near the staircases we found a telescope almost large enough to walk about in the doctor greeted us with the warmest cordiality he was obliging enough to let us see the sun through a dark glass pointing out the two spots discernible upon it one of which is considerable in size at night he showed us the planet he had discovered that bears his name we also inspected at his house a chart of the moon very detailed with the mountains ravines and rivers represented which make that planet resemble the globe we inhabit in fact the whole stretch of our visit went by without a dull moment 
my russian companions adelaide and myself were all delighted with it one cannot speak about the environs of london without calling to mind several fine english watering places matlock for instance offers the precise aspect of a swiss landscape on one side of the promenade are highly effective rocks grown with variegated shrubs and on the other rich meadows this english vegetation is truly lovely it all presents an enchanting view to the eye of those who love nature's beauty i remember following the bank of a stream so dainty and limpid that i could not tear myself away from it tunbridge wells where one also takes the waters is likewise a very picturesque place it is true that although one may enjoy the morning rambles in the beautiful neighborhood in the evenings one is much wearied by the social gatherings which are quite numerous people came together for meals and after supper as after dinner everyone would rise and sing god save the king a prayer for his majesty which moved me to tears through the sad comparison it prompted me to make between england and france brighton was still better known than either tunbridge wells or matlock brighton where the prince of wales had then taken up his residence is a rather pretty town opposite dieppe with the shores of france visible at the time i was there the english feared a descent by the french the generals were perpetually reviewing the militia who were forever marching about with drums beating making an infernal din i took some delightful walks at brighton by the seashore one day i witnessed a singular phenomenon the fog was so thick that the ships off the coast looked as if they were suspended in the air i spent a few days at knoll's castle which after once belonging to queen elizabeth is now the property of lady dorset at the gate of this castle i saw two huge elm trees reported to be more than a thousand years old which nevertheless still bore leaves especially at the top the park whose boundary touches a forest is remarkably picturesque the castle contains some very fine pictures the furniture is still the same as in the day of elizabeth in lady dorset's sleeping apartment the curtains of the bed are all sprinkled with gold and silver stars and the dressing table is of solid silver lady dorset an extremely wealthy lady had married sir a wilford whom i had known as english ambassador at st petersburg he had no fortune but was a fine figure of a man with noble and distinguished mien. the first time we all met for dinner lady dorset said to me you will be very much bored as we never talk at table i reassured her upon this point i told her this was also my own habit having for years nearly always eaten alone she must have been enormously fond of this custom of hers for at dessert her son eleven or twelve years old came in and she hardly spoke to him she finally sent him away without giving him the least sign of affection i could not help thinking of the reputation english women bear that usually when their children are grown up they care little about them which has been taken to mean that they love only their little ones at london i renewed acquaintance with the amiable comte de vaudrille i found him greatly changed and fallen off through all that he had suffered for france he had married his niece in england and i went to see her at twickenham where she was settled the comtesse de vaudrille was young and pretty she had exquisite blue eyes a sweet face and the most striking freshness her invitation to pass a few days at twickenham i accepted and while there i did a portrait of her two sons his highness the duc d'orleans lived near by the comte de vaudrille whom the duc d'orleans had shown special marks of favor took me to see him we found that prince whose chief delight was his studies seated at a long table covered with books one of them lying open before him during the visit he pointed out to me a landscape painted by his brother the duc de montpensier whose acquaintance i also made while staying with madame de vaudrille as for the youngest of these princes the duc de beaujolais i only met him out walking he seemed to have a passably good face and to be very lively 
the duc de montpensier sometimes came for me and we would go out sketching together he took me to the terrace at richmond whence the view is magnificent from that eminence you survey a considerable part of the river's course we also went over the lovely meadow where the trunk of the tree under which milton sat may still be seen it was there so i was informed that he composed his poem of paradise lost altogether the surroundings of twickenham were highly interesting the duc de montpensier knew them to perfection and i congratulated myself on having him for my guide the more as this young prince was exceedingly kind and sympathetic i had engaged to paint a portrait of the margravine of anspach who asked me to stay with her for a few days in the country so that i might redeem my promise as i had heard that the margravine was an eccentric woman who would not allow me a moment's peace would have waked at five every morning and do a thousand equally intolerable things i accepted her invitation only after stipulating certain terms first i requested a room where i should hear no noises on the ground that i wished to get up late then i warned her that in case we went driving anywhere i never talked in a carriage and that i preferred walking alone the good lady agreed to everything and kept her word religiously if i accidentally came upon her in her park where she would often be working like a day laborer she pretended not to see me and let me pass without opening her mouth perhaps the margravine of anspach had been slandered or perhaps she was obliging enough to put constraint upon herself for my sake at all events i felt so much at ease while under her roof that when i was bidden to another country place belonging to her called blenheim i went without hesitation there the park and the house were far better than at armies mole and the time went by in a most agreeable manner charming evening parties plays music nothing lacked indeed though pledged to stay but one week i remained instead three i made some expeditions on the water with the margravine on one occasion we landed at the isle of wight which stands high on a rock and reminds one of switzerland this island is noted for the mild and gentle ways of its inhabitants they all live together i was told like a single family enjoying perfect peace and happiness possibly now since a large number of regiments have been in the island it is no longer the same in respect to the quiet life but it is a fact that at the time of my visit all the population were well dressed civil and benevolent besides the suavity i observed in the people the scenery was so entrancing that i should have liked to spend my life in that beautiful spot only the isle of wight and ischia near naples have ever made me feel such a desire i also went to lord myra's country seat although i have forgotten the name of his house i remember how comfortable everything was and what wonderful cleanliness prevailed all over lord myra's sister lady charlotte kind and courteous did the honors with infinite tact it was therefore unfortunate that the place bored one at dinner the women left the table before dessert the men remained to drink and talk politics i can truthfully state however that at no gathering i attended did the men get drunk this convinces me that if the custom ever existed in england it has now ceased as far as good society is concerned i may also remark that i dined several times at lord myra's with the duke de berry and that the duke never took anything else than water far from drinking too much wine as has since been alleged after dinner we met together in a large hall where the women sat apart occupied with embroidery or tapestry work and not uttering a sound the men on their side took books to hand and observed like silence one evening i asked lord myra's sister since the moon was shining brightly whether we might not walk in the park she replied that the shutters were closed and that caution demanded they should not be reopened because the picture gallery was on the ground floor as the library contained collections of prints my only resource was to seize upon these collections and go through them abstaining in obedience to the general example from a single word of speech 
in the midst of such a taciturn company fancying myself alone one day i happened to make an exclamation on coming to a handsome print which astonished all the rest to the last degree it is nevertheless a fact that the total absence of conversation does not preclude the possibility of pleasant chat in england i know a number of english who are extremely bright i may even add that i never encountered one who was stupid the season was too far advanced when i was at lord myra's to allow of my taking long walks lady charlotte proposed to go driving with me but she went in a sort of carriole as hard as a cart which i could only endure for a short while the english are used to braving their weather i often met them in the pouring rain riding without umbrellas in open carriages they are satisfied with wrapping their cloaks about them but this has its drawbacks for strangers unaccustomed to such a watery state of things homeward bound in these english drives i would sometimes stop on a hill four or five miles from london hoping for a view of that stupendous city but the fog lying upon it was always so thick that i never was able to distinguish anything but the tips of its spires end of chapter seventeen recording by james k white chula vista chapter eighteen of memoirs of madame vigie le bon this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista. Memoirs of Madame Vigie Le Bon by Elizabeth Louise Vigie Le Bon. Translated by Lionel Strachey. Chapter 18. Bonapartes and Bourbons. Although I had come to England with the intention of remaining but five or six months, I had now stayed nearly three years, held not solely by my interests as a painter but also by the kind treatment bestowed upon me i have often heard it said that the english are lacking in hospitality but i am far from sharing that opinion and harbour grateful memories of the cordiality i met with in london though receiving more social invitations than i could possibly accept i nevertheless succeeded and this was said to be very difficult in forming an intimate circle to my taste I achieved it through allying myself with Lady Bentick and her sister, the Villiers' young ladies, Madame Anderson and Lord Trimmelstown, who, an accomplished amateur in the arts, cultivates painting and literature with taste and talent, and who, now in Paris, keeps his friendship for me. I should, therefore, not have decided to return to France so soon had I not learned that my daughter had arrived at Paris. I keenly longed to see her again the more as i was secretly informed that her father allowed her to form connections that to me seemed improper for a young woman and hence i hastened my departure it surely needed a deep motive to resist the appeals which friends and even acquaintances were kind enough to make as at this period bonaparte who had proclaimed himself emperor prohibited all english people in france after the rupture of the peace of amiens from leaving lady hearn well known for her artistic proclivities said that i ought to be kept back as a hostage at the moment i was to get into the post-chaise that was to convey me to the inn near my place of embarkation the charming madame grassini appeared on the scene i thought she had simply come to bid me farewell but she declared she wished to take me to the inn and made me get into her carriage which i found full of pillows and packages what is all this for i inquired you are not aware then she replied that you are going to the worst inn of the world you may have to wait there a week or more if the wind is not favourable and i have made up my mind to stay with you i can hardly say how moved i was at this token of affection the beautiful woman was leaving the pleasures of london and her friends to say nothing of the host of admirers always in her train merely to keep me company to me this seemed lovable and I have never forgotten it. It was a great joy to me to see my friends once more, and especially my daughter. Her husband, whom she had accompanied to France, was charged by Prince Narishkin 
with the mission of engaging musical artists for st petersburg he left a few months later but alone for love alas had long since vanished and my daughter remained to my great satisfaction to her misfortune and mine my child had a very quick temper besides i had not been able to instill into her completely my own distaste for bad company add to this that whether through my own fault or not her power over my mind was great and i had none over hers and it will be understood how she sometimes made me shed bitter tears still she was my daughter her beauty her gifts her cleverness rendered her as fascinating as possible and though i mourned because i could not persuade her to come to live with me since she persisted in seeing certain people i would not receive i at any rate saw her every day and that in itself was a great blessing one evening i arranged some living pictures of a kind which had won warm approval in st petersburg and being careful to place behind the gauze none but handsome men and pretty women the result was charming another day i painted on a screen several headdresses of historic characters making holes under them for the insertion of a face the conversation passing with those who put in their heads amused us vastly robert who took part in all our gaieties like a schoolboy put his face under ninon's headdress which made us laugh like mad all these particulars may seem childish today when evening parties are taken up with talking politics or playing cards but some of us had not yet lost the habit of enjoying ourselves and the fact is we enjoyed ourselves very much after all these pleasures were well worth the cards of parisian and the stifling routs of london drawing-rooms one of the first people i met upon my return from london was madame de segur and i frequently went to see her one day her husband told me that my journey to england had displeased the emperor who had curtly remarked madame lebrun went to see her friends but bonaparte's resentment against me could not have been violent since a few days after speaking thus he sent monsieur denon to me with an order to paint his sister madame murat i thought i could not refuse although i was only to be paid eighteen hundred francs that is to say less than half of what i usually asked for portraits of the same size this sum was the more moderate too because for the sake of satisfying myself as to the composition of the picture i painted madame murat's pretty little girl beside her and that without raising the price i could not conceivably describe all the annoyances all the torments i underwent in painting this picture to begin with at the first sitting madame murat brought two ladies maids who were to do her hair while i was painting her however upon my remark that i could not under such circumstances do justice to her features she vouchsafed to send her servants away then she perpetually failed to keep the appointments she made with me so that in my desire to finish i was kept in paris nearly the whole summer as a rule waiting for her in vain which angered me unspeakably moreover the intervals between the sittings were so long that she sometimes changed her mode of doing her hair in the beginning for instance she wore curls hanging over her cheeks and i painted them accordingly but some time after this having gone out of fashion she came back with her hair dressed in a totally different manner so that i was forced to scrape off the hair i had painted on the face and was likewise compelled to blot out a brow band of pearls and put cameos in its place the same thing happened with her dress one i had painted at first was cut rather open as dresses were then so worn and furnished with wide embroidering the fashion having changed i was obliged to close in the dress and do the embroidering anew all the annoyances that madame murat subjected me to at last put me so much out of temper that one day when she was in my studio i said to monsieur denon loudly enough for her to hear i have painted real princesses who never worried me and never made me wait the fact is madame murat was unaware that punctuality is the politeness of kings as louis the fourteenth so well said delivered of the vexations arising from madame murat's portrait i resumed the peaceful life i was accustomed to 
but my desire for travel was not yet stilled i had never seen switzerland i therefore resolved to leave paris once more and soon was making for the mountains in the period succeeding my swiss travels i at length acquired an inclination for rest this together with a taste i had always had for the country prompted me to leave for louvesien before the breaking of the first buds and consequently i was established there by the time the allies were making their second descent upon paris it is well known that the villages fared much worse than the towns at the hands of the foreign troops i shall never forget the night of march thirty first eighteen fourteen ignorant that danger was so near i had not as yet considered flight it was eleven o'clock in the evening and i had just gone to bed when joseph my swiss manservant who spoke german entered my room in the belief that i should need protection the village was being invaded by the prussians who were sacking all the houses and joseph was followed by three soldiers with villainous faces who approached my bed with brandished swords joseph tried to fool them by saying in german that i was swiss and an invalid but paying no attention to him they began by taking my gold snuff-box which was on my nightstand then they felt under my quilt to find out whether i had any money concealed one of them calmly slicing off a piece of the quilt with his sword another who seemed to be french or at least spoke our language perfectly said give her back the box but far from exceeding his companions went to my desk and seized upon everything it contained afterward the soldiers pillaged my cupboards at last after putting me through four hours of mortal fright these terrible people quit my house nor was this my only experience of the kind with the return of the foreigners in eighteen fifteen some english came to louvisien they robbed me of a number of articles among them a magnificent large lacquer box that i sorely regretted losing since it had been given me in st petersburg by my old friend count stroganov after the nocturnal visit by the prussians i wanted to go to st germain but the road was not safe enough so i took refuge with a good person living at marley near madame du barry's pavilion other women frightened like myself had already chosen this place we all dined together and slept six in a room as far as sleep was possible the nights went by with continual alarms and i felt the liveliest anxiety for my poor servant to whom i owed my life the faithful fellow had insisted on staying in my house to hold the soldiers in check i had the greatest fears on his account as the village was entirely given up to plunder the peasants camped in the vineyards and slept on straw in the open air after being robbed of all their possessions several of them sought us out lamenting their misfortunes and these mournful tales were recited in madame du barry's splendid garden near the temple of love amid flowers and under the brightest of skies i was so appalled by their stories and by the incessant cannonading and fusillading that one evening i attempted to go down into a cellar and stay there but i hurt my leg and was obliged to come up again the last affair happened at rocancourt there was also fighting near madame hocart's house very near the place where i was we learned that after the combat the prussians had sacked from top to bottom the house of a very bonapartist lady who during the fight screamed from her terrace to the french kill all those people the victors having heard her broke into the house and smashed all the mirrors and the furniture as well while the lady in her chemise and without shoes was fleeing to versailles where she found shelter ultimately louis the eighteenth entered paris ready to forgive and forget i went to see him pass on the quai des orfevres he was in a carriage seated beside the duchess d'angoulême the constitution he had announced had been greeted with joyful acclamation the delight of the people was great and universal flags hung from all the windows on the line of march cries of long live the king rose to the skies and were so loud and heartfelt that i was moved beyond anything i can say 
in the duchess d'angouleme's face was to be read in turn her pleasure at such a welcome and the painful memories assailing her her smile was sweet but sad a most natural thing because she was following the road her mother had followed in going to execution and she knew it however the exultation evoked by the king's appearance and hers went far to console that afflicted heart the plaudits pursued them to the tuileries where the crowds filling the gardens gave vent to the same transports they sang they danced in front of the palace and when the king showed himself at the window of the large balcony and kissed his hands over and over again to the people their joy knew no bounds that evening there was a grand court reception at the tuileries an immense number of women attended the king spoke to them all most graciously and to some of them even recalled various incidents creditable to their families possessed of an extreme desire to get a close view of louis the eighteenth i mingled with the crowd that gathered on sunday in the corridor to see him go by on his way to mass i was opposite the windows with the rest so that the king could easily distinguish me when he did he stepped over to me gave me his hand in the most affable manner and said a thousand flattering things about the pleasure he felt in meeting me once more as he remained thus holding my hand for several moments and addressing none of the other women the onlookers must no doubt have taken me for a very great lady because no sooner had the king passed than a young officer seeing that i was alone offered me his arm and would not leave me until he had escorted me to my carriage most of the people who came back with our princes were either friends or acquaintances of mine it was very sweet after all those years of exile to meet again in the country of our birth but alas this happiness endured only a few months for while we were rejoicing at our lot bonaparte was landing at cannes at midnight on the nineteenth of march eighteen fifteen louis the eighteenth and the whole royal family left paris napoleon entered the next day at eight of the evening resuming possession of the tuileries the troops filling the courtyards giving our prince's palace the aspect of a castle taken by assault without offence to the memory of a great captain and the brave generals and soldiers who helped him to win such fine victories one may well ask what bonaparte's victories have led to and whether an inch of the ground remains to us that cost us so much blood what proves how tired the people were of those eternal wars was their lack of enthusiasm during the hundred days the king returned to paris on the eighth of july eighteen fifteen amid almost unanimous rejoicings since after all our misfortunes louis the eighteenth brought back peace henceforth it was seen how this prince combined wisdom and ability with his more brilliant mental qualities times were critical and louis the eighteenth was assuredly the ruler to suit the period with much courage and coolness he united elevation of soul and great subtlety of mind all his ways were royal he gave readily and liberally he was fond of patronizing art and letters which he himself cultivated his features were by no means devoid of beauty and so noble was their expression that infirm though he was the first sight of him called forth involuntary respect his favorite recreation was talking about literature with clever people in his youth he had written very pretty verses and his style was that of an accomplished man of letters knowing latin perfectly he liked to converse in that language with our most learned latinists his memory was prodigious he could always repeat the most striking passages of a book read rapidly of a piece seen once Ducis, who before the revolution had occupied a post in monsieur's household came out from his retreat at versailles to present his homage to the king louis at once recognized him welcomed him warmly and recited the best lines of his oedipus scarcely remembered by the aged author his majesty was himself the author of several political writings and an account of a journey to koblenz there are also attributed to him the text of the opera the caravan and the lutenist of lubeck a prose play in one act given at the theatre francois 
he had a strong attachment for the theatre francois he often went to that playhouse and especially admired the acting of talma whenever that great actor happening to be on duty for the week carried a torch before the king to his box louis would regularly stop to talk with him a long time these conversations were in english spoken by both as well as their own language it was reported to me that talma had said i prefer louis the eighteenth's courtesy to bonaparte's pension courtesy in fact is the greatest charm of princes it doubles the value of the slightest favor in this regard his highness the comte d'artois was in no way behind his brother by no means forgotten are the innumerable apt sayings bearing the corner mark of kindness with which he won men's hearts after his accession to the throne upon the death of louis the eighteenth i chanced to be at the louvre the day he was giving medals to the painters and sculptors before presenting them he said in the most sympathetic manner they are not encouragements but rewards all the artists were touched by the delicate compliment implied in these words as for the duke de berry if he had not quite the same courtesy as his father he was as clever especially in that timely quickness of wit so useful to princes i select one example out of a thousand the first time he reviewed some troops he heard a few cries from the ranks of long live the emperor quite right my friends was his immediate remark every one must live upon which the same soldiers exclaimed long live the duke de berry his goodness of heart went so far that not only did he interest himself in everything that concerned his friends but behaved toward the domestics of his household as the father of a family might have done he was worshipped by his servants and employed his influence to encourage them in good conduct and in making whatever savings they could one day as he was about to enter his carriage a little kitchen scullion came running up to him with your highness i have saved fifteen francs this year well my boy that makes thirty said the duke giving him the sum the boy had mentioned the duke de berry kept his revenues in good order his heaviest expenses were occasioned by his taste for the arts a predilection shared by his amiable wife the duchess de berry was fond of encouraging young artists she would buy their pictures and often order more her liberality in paying never made her forget the duty of politeness incumbent upon rank she showed model civility in all her dealings with men of talent of the duchess d'angouleme i would not venture to speak what could i say that would not fall short of the truth the merits of this princess are known to the whole world and i fear i should but weaken the future verdict of history it is equally well known that fate united her with a prince whose high soul worthily appreciated her such was the family brought back to us by the restoration it is for politicians to explain how so many virtues and excellencies were insufficient to preserve the throne to them my grateful heart cannot but regret them under bonaparte the large portrait i made of the queen and her children had been relegated to a corner of the palace of versailles i left paris one morning to take a glance at it arrived at the royal gate a guard escorted me to the room which contained the picture and which was forbidden the public the custodian who admitted us recognized me from having seen me in rome and exclaimed oh how glad i am to welcome madame lebrun here he hastened to turn my picture round which was facing the wall since bonaparte after learning that many came to look at it had ordered its removal the order as is plain was very badly obeyed since the exhibition of the picture continued and this to such a degree that the custodian when i wanted to give him a trifle persisted in declining it saying that i had earned him enough money when the restoration came this picture was re-exhibited at the salon i was keeping for myself another picture representing the queen done during the reign of bonaparte i had painted marie antoinette ascending to heaven to her left on some clouds are louis the sixteenth and two angels symbolizing the two children he had lost 
as soon as the peace of my country seemed assured i abandoned all thoughts of leaving it again and divided my time between paris and the country my liking for my pretty house at louvesien was undiminished i spent eight months of the year there and in those surroundings my life flowed as smoothly as possible i painted i busied myself about the garden i took long solitary walks and on sundays i received my friends so fond was i of louvesien that wishing to bequeath the place something to remember me by i painted a picture of saint genoviva for the church madame de genlis was good enough to dedicate a poem to me in acknowledgment if i gave away pictures some were given me and that in the heartiest manner i had frequently expressed a desire that my friends should commemorate themselves on the panels of my drawing-room at louvesien one fine summer's morning at four o'clock while i was asleep the prince de crespy the baron de feasthamel monsieur de riviere and my niece eugenia lebrun set silently to work by ten o'clock each frame was filled my surprise may be imagined when upon coming down to breakfast i entered the room and found it adorned with these delightful paintings as well as with garlands of flowers it was my birthday tears came into my eyes the only thanks i was able to offer in eighteen nineteen his highness the duc de berry signified his wish to buy my sibyl which he had seen in my studio at london and although i perhaps prized this most of all my works i speedily complied with his request some years later i painted her highness the duchess de berry who gave me sittings at the tuileries with the politest punctuality and besides showed me a friendliness than which none could have been greater i shall never forget how while i was painting her one day she said wait a moment then getting up she went to her library for a book containing an article in my praise which she was obliging enough to read aloud from beginning to end during one of these sittings the duc de bordeaux brought his mother a copy-book in which his master had written very good the duchess gave the boy two louis the little prince who might have been about six began to jump for joy shouting this will do for my poor and for my old woman first of all when he was gone the duchess told me that her son referred to a poor soul he often met when he went out and of whom he was particularly fond while the duchess sat for me i would become irritated at the number of people who came to make calls she took note of this and was so considerate as to say why did you not ask me to pose at your house which she did for the two final sittings i confess that i never could think of such affecting warmth of heart without comparing the time i devoted to this genial princess with the melancholy hours madame murat had made me spend i painted two portraits of the duchess de berry in the first she is wearing a red velvet dress and in the other one a blue velvet i have no idea what has become of these pictures i must now speak of the sad years of my life during which in a brief space i saw the beings dearest to me depart this world first i lost monsieur le bon true that for a long time i had entertained no relations whatever with him yet i was none the less mournfully affected by his death you cannot without regret be separated forever from one to whom so close a tie as marriage has bound you this blow however was far less than the cruel grief i experienced at the death of my daughter i hastened to her as soon as i heard of her illness but the disease progressed rapidly and i cannot tell what i felt when all hope of saving her was gone when going to see her the last day my eyes fell upon that dreadfully sunken face i fainted away my old friend madame de noville rescued me from that bed of sorrow she supported me for my legs would not carry me and took me home the next day i was childless madame de verdun came with the news and vainly tried to soften my despair all the wrongdoing of the poor little one vanished i saw her again i still see her in the days of her childhood alas she was so young 
why did she not survive me it was in 1819 that i was bereft of my daughter and in 1820 i lost my brother so many successive shocks plunged me into such deep dejection that my friends grieving for my state urged me to try the distraction of a journey i therefore decided to visit bordeaux i did not know that town and hence the anticipation changed the current of my thoughts nor was i disappointed my health benefited from the journey and i returned to paris less dark in spirit from that day to this i have traveled no more after my return from bordeaux i resumed my daily habits and my work which of all distractions i have always found the best although having had the misfortune to lose so many dear ones i did not remain forsaken i have mentioned madame de riviere my niece who through her affection and her ministrations is the blessing of my life i must also speak of my other niece eugenia lebrun now madame tripier le franc her studies at first prevented me from seeing her as often as i should have liked to for since her earliest youth her disposition her mental qualities and her great gift for painting had promised to be a joy to me i took pleasure in guiding her in lavishing my counsels upon her and in watching her progress i am well rewarded to-day when she has realized all my hopes by her lovely character and her very remarkable talent for painting she has followed the same course as myself in the adoption of portrait painting and is earning success merited by fine coloring by great sincerity and particularly by perfect resemblance still young she can but add to a reputation which in her diffidence and modesty she has scarcely ventured to foresee madame tripier le franc and madame de riviere have become my daughters they bring back all of a mother's feelings to me and their tender devotion spreads a beautiful charm over my existence it is among these two dear creatures and the friends who have been spared me that i hope to end peacefully a wandering and even a laborious but honest life the end end of chapter eighteen Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista. End of Memoirs of Madame Vigie Le Bon by Elizabeth Louise Vigie Le Bon. Translated by Lionel Strachey.